Hello, I'm Stuart White. I'm from the Institute for Sustainable Futures at the University of Technology, Sydney. It's uh, fantastic to be here presenting to you and I'd like to give my thanks to Waterlinks for the opportunity. I want to talk today about urban water futures and in particular urban water futures in the context of changing climate and in the context of the uncertainty that we face uh, in terms of future climate. So the issues I'll be covering will be looking at climate futures, uh, what we can expect, what we're already starting to see, and the importance of our urban water systems becoming more resilient, becoming more adaptable and flexible uh, in the context of extreme climate events. And that will involve looking at planning, both short and long term. And certainly decision making and planning are the two key aspects of uh, change in our future water system. I want to talk about the demand side and the importance of demand side uh, in urban water futures, the importance of engagement and consultation, and also the need for a diverse portfolio uh, of different water systems in order to have a more flexible and adaptive urban water future. And I also want to make some general conclusions and particularly use examples from the Institute's work both in Australia uh, and also in other countries. As you can see, we've worked in a number of other countries uh, across the world. So thinking about climate, uh, we've seen, of course, already the impact of climate change. Almost certainly the droughts that have been seen, the extreme droughts, the extreme uh, floods, typhoons and so on, are signs of more energy in the atmosphere creating uh, a greater level of extremes in terms of our weather and shifts in those patterns uh, to different regions. So this will become greater, more extreme. So we need to be prepared for that and to plan for that. The weather system, climatic systems, have always been uncertain. But what we've recognised, of course, is with increased climate change, that we'll have greater uncertainty in the system and we need to be able to live with that uncertainty and to have flexible systems that can cope with that uncertainty. And that uncertainty and those extreme weather conditions has an impact on our utility systems. Obviously the water system uh, is most affected in terms of drought, in terms of uh, floods uh, and so on, but it also affects our energy system as I'll discuss later. So what we need to do is to design our urban water systems and our urban utility systems to be able to be more resilient, uh, to increase our level of preparedness so that we're not responding to these uh, events through building our way out or trying to drought proof or flood proof the system. This becomes an extremely expensive venture and is essentially becomes impossible because of the uh, cost and the infrastructure required to push from 90% to 95 to 99% uh, in terms of uh, the ability to cope. So what we need to do is to design systems where we can prepare better uh, for droughts, uh, for floods and so on. And part of that our research has shown both in the energy systems and in water systems is to have a greater reliance on distributed systems. If we distribute the risk, uh, if we develop smaller scale, modular, flexible systems uh, that, are, that can be built at the right scale at the right time, then we can increase that resilience and increase the ability of the system to cope with shocks. In Australia, we've had a long experience of living with a variable climate. And one of our famous uh, national poets has written uh, of the Australian landscape of droughts and flooding rains. And indeed, the last uh, severe drought that Australia had, the so-called millennium drought, which lasted from 2000 to 2015, ended with one of the worst floods on record in Brisbane. So we have this experience of the cycles of droughts and floods uh, which have given us some insight into what the future might hold uh, with a greater extreme of these kind of events. So Australia, as I said, had the millennium drought uh, in some areas, some states and cities was the worst drought on uh, our meteorological record. 
uh, and in many of those cities we nearly ran out of water. So if it had not been for the water saving measures, the water efficiency measures, which I'll talk about later, then we would almost certainly have reached dead storage in many of those cities. So this is a, a serious uh, and extremely impactful and expensive consequence of drought which needs to be taken into account and of course will get worse with the extremes that we expect from climate change. Another factor worthy of mention is that we cannot isolate and consider the water sector, the water utility sector, as being uh, st a standalone or by itself. We need to consider the linkage between the water sector and the energy sector in particular and indeed other sectors. One of the first and most obvious aspects is hydropower. So we see in recent uh, droughts in Brazil uh, a major impact on the energy sector, very large increases in the cost of fossil fuel purchases as a result of the drought impacting on the outputs of hydropower stations. In countries such as the Philippines is also a uh, a relatively high dependence on hydropower from some parts of the country. Even in Australia we have a dependence for peak power on hydro capacity. And in recent droughts in Australia, in particularly the 1980s, there were instances where thermal power station generation was restricted due to the lack of cooling water. So we see a, another linkage uh, into thermal power generation as well. And what we've also seen is in response to the drought, uh, in response to water security concerns, uh, water utilities need to move further from cities to pump water longer distances, which increases the energy intensity of water use. And also the construction of desalination plants causing a significant increase in the intensity of water use. So we're seeing changes which are actually bringing the water energy nexus uh, into even sharper relief and uh, even stronger nexus. And finally, it's important to recognise that it's also overlapping with irrigation, irrigation and irrigated agriculture because many urban water supply systems are strongly interconnected to uh, rural irrigation. They often are using the same watersheds, competing for the same water resources. And as diets change, we see a significant increase in the requirements, the water requirements uh, of um, people eating higher up the food chain. So a greater consumption of animal products means that a greater demand for water for livestock uh, and livestock indeed are responsible for uh, at least the same level of greenhouse gas emissions as our transport sector and it's rapidly increasing particularly because of the emissions of methane. So we see as global diets change towards a greater dependence on livestock we're seeing an increase in water consumption as well as an increase in greenhouse gas emissions. So we have a food, diet, water, energy and climate nexus which needs to be taken into account. And a lot of this is underpinned by a, a recent development which is the sustainable development goals themselves. And many of you will of course be familiar with uh, these 17 goals uh, signed off by 193 countries in September last year in New York City and uh, succeeding the Millennium Development Goals which themselves were a quiet success story in terms of reducing poverty, improving health outcomes, improving water and sanitation outcomes. But the Sustainable Development Goals represent a significant improvement on those Millennium Development Goals both because they're broader, covering a much larger uh, number of uh, areas, but also because they apply not only to low income countries but also to high income countries. So it's worth recognising that it's the high income countries which have placed the greatest burden on our energy and resources and the greatest burden on waste generation over the years. Uh, so 20% of the world's population using 80% of the world's resources. So it's really important and this sustainable development goals give us an opportunity to incorporate and have a more integrated approach uh, to some of these important goals. So we hope uh, and we believe that over the next 15 years uh, we can start to see the kickstarting of a, a, a changed way of thinking about these goals. 
and so we can see the uh, particular goals that we're looking at uh, will be the water goals, the sustainable building goals, uh, the climate change and the energy goals, uh, which are the ones that are most significant in terms of urban water futures because we, with urbanisation, we're now seeing more than 50% of the world's population living in cities and we're also seeing uh, an increase in that urbanisation such that we expect over 70% of the world's population to live in cities by 2030. So we see uh, the extreme importance of getting the infrastructure for those cities right the first time so that we can massively reduce the environmental impact and massively reduce the cost. And part of that is about recognising the importance of merging the long-term and the short-term planning so that we're not considering ad hoc responses during drought. And one of the lessons we learnt uh, from the Millennium Drought in Australia was that where that integration of long-term supply-demand planning and drought response planning had been most integrated, uh, done together, then we saw the best outcomes. And this is an extremely important lesson that was learnt in Australia. And part of that is in recognition of the fact that for extreme climate events we'll need to have a more resilient system in order to respond to shocks. We need to recognise there's a balance between the resistance of a system uh, where you can respond to long-term known variability in the weather, uh, which is a traditional planning model. We need, in order to be able to respond appropriately to shocks, to have a system which is more flexible, which is more modular, and will provide a more resilient system uh, in terms of urban water infrastructure. And one of the key lessons that we've learnt and the key aspects of our research is the importance of the demand side. So the demand side of the water system uh, is the, the use. What is it that people are using water for? And in fact, when we look at the water supply system, we recognise that People don't need water. What they need are the services that water provides, so clean clothes, uh, washing, uh, sanitation and so on. So these are the services which water provides and those services can be provided with a range of different levels of efficiency, with different types of equipment and appliances and also even with different qualities of water itself. And so part of our work is to look at how do we provide those services as distinct from how do we provide that water, but how do we provide those services at the least cost and the least environmental impact and with the best in terms of social outcomes. And so we see on this graph we can see that the uh, contribution to the water supply demand balance in Sydney, in this case the long term supply demand balance in Sydney is provided in majority by uh, the existing dams, by the existing water supply system uh, and also some new water supplies and some new recycling. But the biggest single contribution to the new water supply demand requirements for Sydney is actually coming from water efficiency. It's coming from water savings, which itself come from a whole range of different uh, opportunities, whether it's uh, reducing system losses through pressure uh, reduction and loss management, or whether it's through uh, improving the efficiency of businesses, factories, shops, offices, or whether it's through the appliances and fixtures that households use and making sure that new households and new appliances are as efficient as they can be. So you see the small contributions from a range of different water saving measures adding up to the largest single and indeed the cheapest and quickest contribution to the long-term supply-demand balance. And so if we look at that in a time series, we can see that uh, in the 1960s and 70s we saw a rapid growth in per capita water demand. So this is the bulk water demand per person, so it includes system losses, it includes business use and it includes residential use. So we see it rising through to the 1980s to approximately 500, 500 litres per person per day, so half a cubic metre per person per day and then equally rapidly uh, dropping as we move into the 90s and uh, 2000. And so we can see that we were able to add in the population 
uh, on the red line you can see an increase in population uh, in Sydney, fairly uh, rapid increase, and then we see that we're able to add a million new people to the city without increasing the total demand for water. So the total demand for water stayed flat while the population increased by a million people. And we see similar patterns in other parts of the world, including Los Angeles, similar, similar diagrams uh, could be shown. So if we drill down a little and just look at one of the many, many contributions to the water demand, and toilets, of course, uh, uh, small uses on each case, but multiplied together across a city, across the number of households, uh, we see uh, a significant contribution to water demand. And we can see when we look at the uh, uh, pattern of water use by toilets uh, and the types of toilets that we have in the city, and these stock models are part of our research into the end use of water uh, and the service that water provides, we see the decline in the single flush toilet and the rise of the dual flush toilet, which is actually an Australian invention. And as dual flush toilets themselves become more efficient, moving from 12 litre, 6 litre, through to 9 litre, 4.5 litre, and ultimately to the most recent, uh, most efficient toilet that we have currently on the market, the 4.5 litre, 3 litre dual flush toilet uh, increasing. So we see the change as new houses are built and as toilets are replaced, we see the uh, relatively rapid change in a short time frame uh, of the different types of toilets. So you may say, well, what's the significance of this? What does this actually mean for water consumption? And so we can see that if we multiply that out by the population, uh, by the millions and millions of toilets uh, in the country, we can see that we will never use as much water flushing toilets as we did in the 1990s. Uh, it's peaked and it's coming down the other side uh, and we haven't even yet reached the most efficient possible toilets, the improvements are being made uh, every year uh, and so we can see just with that one appliance, that one fixture, we can see the dynamics of improved efficiency and what that means uh, for total water use. Now we multiply that of course by showers, by cooling towers, uh, by washing machines and so on and then we add up to a very uh, significant shift in water demand and a reduction in water demand. And so there's an analogy here. There's a comparison we can make to the so-called environmental Kuznets curve, uh, which typically is applied to pollution. So the idea that as communities and societies increase their level of affluence, their level of development, then you get an increase uh, in pollution, or in this case of water, energy or materials use per person, uh, until you reach a certain point of development when a, a society or community can afford to invest in pollution reduction, or in this case efficiency, and then reducing down the other side, which is the blue curve at the top. However, what we're, uh, our research is asking the question, what would need to happen in order to avoid and to tunnel through or to leapfrog uh, that wasteful process of uh, increasing water consumption only to then improve the efficiency to reduce on the other side. So this is some of the research that we're doing uh, is to ask the question what systems, what planning, what processes and what technology would need to be put in place in order to achieve this tunnelling through uh, to avoid that high cost, high water use, high sewage generation process. And we see here some results uh, of our work uh, from some workshops that we've conducted in the Philippines looking at uh, estimates based on workshop estimates of water use. It's very difficult to obtain uh, accurate data without detailed surveys, but we can see uh, water use in toilet, shower, laundry, and some projections of what will happen if water use, uh, if those appliances change uh, and the uh, uh, as development occurs and we just use the standard appliances which are likely to be used without any other regulations uh, or systems to encourage the use of water efficient appliances. And on the right hand side of the graph we see three projections which show what could happen if we installed best practice appliances as 
uh, households and communities uh, increase their use of water, uh, uh, water efficient appliances and increase their use of appliances at all and in get increasing access to water services. So there's a stark contrast between people connecting to water services uh, in the way in which high income countries uh, the trajectory they followed, which was a very inefficient one, followed by efficiency some 10 or 20 years later, compared to leapfrogging direct to the more efficient path in the beginning. So in this way, we can resolve what is a historical tension and a historical trade-off between uh, the access to water services and the equity requirements of that with the water supply, uh, water resource constraints and water conservation on the other hand. And we see this as a much cheaper pathway, uh, a much more socially equitable and a much more sustainable pathway. And part of this is to recognise that the historical view uh, for the water supply system is to look only from the perspective of the utility uh, and to think, well, what is the lowest cost option for the utility to continue to provide increased water services uh, or increased water supply, indeed, uh, to customers? But what we really should be doing is broadening the system boundary. If we think in systems terms, then we need to think about the utility plus the customers and the customers' premises themselves past the water meter then to the equipment and fixtures in the customer's premises, because they are, after all, one of the key determinants of the water supply system, then to the practices and processes, and then ultimately, of course, the possibility of those systems to be interconnected and to provide feedback to customers. So the ultimate uh, possibility for water futures uh, is to have an interconnection and feedback, but also to consider the whole system to incorporate uh, the customer's premises and the equipment and fixtures in those customer's premises. And we know from our research in many places in Australia and elsewhere in the world that this is the lowest cost uh, way to proceed. So we know from the many, many supply curves of conserved water that we've developed, this is just one example from our capital in Canberra, uh, where all of the options which uh, in, improve the supply-demand balance, which are shown on the bottom left of that graph, are the water efficiency options, the demand side options, those options which involve reducing water use, are the lowest cost options and provide the largest amount of water at least cost uh, compared to supply options. So the same pattern occurs whenever we've looked at this situation across the world. And indeed, if it had not been for those water efficiency options, if it had not been for the conservation measures that were put in place, then it's almost certain that, as I said before, cities in Australia would have run out of water during the previous drought. And here's some results for the city of Melbourne that show the impact of the water use reduction that we saw during the drought in Melbourne, which meant that the levels in the dam did not reach uh, dead storage and uh, did not uh, require emergency measures. And part of the success was not only the improvement in the efficiency of water use, but also the communication and engagement that took place. So we saw a number of measures which brought the community together, which asked the community to participate in and contribute to uh, the programs that were involved. So to reduce their water use through changing their practices as well as participating in programs to take up incentives, to improve, uh, to replace their appliances and fixtures with more efficient equipment and so on. And we can see the dramatic reduction in this case, uh, some data from Brisbane and South East Queensland uh, where the water demand uh, before the drought in the red curve uh, shows a very long tail of very high water use by households. Uh, and then after the drought, we see a, uh, a strong bunching of water use at much lower levels uh, and, a, and a much tighter distribution uh, of water use, removing the long tail of the high water users. And part of 
uh, the important measures that need to be put in place to do that is to engage the community in decision making uh, in regard to uh, water investments and uh, the processes of implementing urban water futures. And I would have to say that this is one of the areas that Australia during the millennium drought could have improved. It, there wasn't sufficient engagement of the community in making what ultimately became multi-billion dollar decisions about investment. So there was not a sufficient engagement with the community to ask questions which only the community can answer about values and trade-offs between investment, between the level of service that's provided, uh, and between issues such as environmental flows, which are often values decisions which should be made by citizens, should be made by the community, and not made solely by decision makers, planners, engineers and economists. And the other aspect which I think is really important and was another missed opportunity uh, during the Australian millennium drought, but we are seeing uh, starting in many cities uh, around the world, is to implement systems which are modular, scalable and demonstrate the innovation in technology that's starting to occur. So we've seen rapid changes uh, in the processes and systems for small-scale wastewater treatment. We've seen rapid improvements in the efficiency of appliances, as I discussed earlier. And we've seen great interest in improving the extraction of nutrients from wastewater in order to improve environmental outcomes and in order to capture those valuable nutrients for reuse. And so the combination of all those things could be a very powerful tool for ensuring that our water supply system uh, is more uh, cost effective and uh, is uh, more resilient in terms of climate change. In order to understand the opportunities for the future of water infrastructure, it's useful for us to consider the past. And in our work, we've looked at the possibility of four generations of water infrastructure, starting with the system that applied prior to the Industrial Revolution in many high income countries, where there was no water infrastructure and there was an unmanaged and, un and decentralised system, which of course had significant impacts on public health uh, and on economic outcomes and so on. So we saw the incidence of cholera uh, and uh, fire and flooding in our cities. So in fact, the centralised systems that we know today of water supply, sanitation and stormwater were developed in response to those public health, fire and flood threats. And so over the next 150 to 200 years we saw the development of those systems and the principle that the larger the network, the lower the cost per connection. And then of course we realised the impact of discharge of sewage to waterways and oceans uh, and the cost and requirements for greater extractions of water supply reaching the limits of natural water supplies and so we see the rise of desalination, advanced wastewater treatment and so on which we call transitional or neo-centralised. But in the last 10, 20, 30 years we've seen the development of an emerging or fourth generation of water infrastructure which comprises improved water efficiency, maximising the efficiency with which water is used. It involves source control, so you can see the removal of nutrients, the removal of pollutants uh, prior to discharge to wastewater systems. We see the development of energy recovery systems, nutrient recovery systems, and also the development of localised small scale systems where the cost of transport is reduced and that cost is transferred and invested in treatment because of the rise of improved small scale treatment systems. And so this emerging fourth generation is extremely interesting in terms of the future of the urban water system. It's considered as a system, uh, a more integrated approach, we're using not just natural water sources but also the resources from rainwater, from stormwater and from recycled wastewater and a recovery or circular economy principle is being applied. And it's possible, and our research is investigating, the question of what is 
the cost of this. And so it's quite possible that the uh, fourth generation has some cost benefits compared to the increased energy, the increased requirements of the third generation. And in particular, because we can reduce the cost of the transport uh, network. And we see here an excellent analogy with uh, other systems. So in telecommunications, we've seen a leapfrogging from fixed phone telephony through to mobile phone telephony. Many countries have completely bypassed uh, the costly uh, and resource intensive approach to uh, telecommunications associated with landlines uh, straight to mobile telephony and have a very advanced system for that. Similarly in energy we're starting to realise in our work and our research that decentralised approaches to energy which incorporate energy efficiency, peak demand management and distributed generation including solar photovoltaics, tri-generation, uh, small scale wind and so on have actually got some significant cost advantages as well as reliability advantages relative to the centralised system and particularly more useful in dealing with the extreme events associated with climate change and also in terms of reducing greenhouse gas emissions and mitigating climate change. And we are now starting to see the same thing occurring with water supply systems themselves in terms of uh, this fourth generation of water supply being a, a way of transitioning or leapfrogging to a more sustainable system without having to go through the 100 to 150 years of installing the systems that have been installed in many high income countries. And so we see uh, an example here of the fourth generation in practice. So this is uh, Central Park, a development in the centre of Sydney. You can see Sydney Central Station on the top right of this diagram. Uh, as it happens, uh, just over the road from our university, uh, the University of Technology Sydney with the large brown building uh, in the centre of the picture and we see a, um, uh, a former brewery site, uh, which uh, an industrial site which has been reformed, recycled if you will, uh, to make a new development, uh, mixed residential, commercial uh, and retail development which has in the basement a one megalitre per day wastewater treatment plant which recovers all the wastewater from the site, uh, uses it uh, high quality recycled water now used for irrigation, for uh, toilet flushing and for cooling tower use and other purposes uh, as well as its own power plant which produces uh, low greenhouse intensive uh, electricity and chilled water and hot water for the site. So you see a, uh, an ecosystem uh, which is looking at uh, a localised solution for sustainability outcomes. So in conclusion we can see uh, from our research and from our work the integration of long-term supply demand planning and drought response is definitely the way forward to improve the outcomes in urban water systems, but demand side options, water efficiency in particular is the cheapest, quickest and largest contribution that we can make to future water supply demand balance, but it's extremely important that we engage communities, engage citizens, so it's a combination of uh, planners and decision makers both speaking but also listening to the community and that if we consider these future proofing options, the fourth generation offers no regrets options which need to be implemented in order to have a more robust and resilient system uh, for the future. Very happy to, uh, to correspond and to uh, engage with anyone who is, who's interested to discuss our, our work. Uh, here is our website where many of our reports uh, are included. Uh, and I'd be very happy to, uh, to respond to any questions that anyone would have. Thank you very much.